Hello, everybody. I'm Drew Duncan. The show's fired up, and we are live. I am brought to you in part by WBFR Block 50 Radio, which is online 24 7, 365 at block50radio.com. I am wherever you are listening to podcasts. Take your device to play Fired Up by Drew Duncan on iTunes, iHeart, wherever you're listening. I am there. Guys, plenty to get to today. We're going to be talking about the Eagles, the Giants, the alleged tampering. Obviously, both teams are denying. Well, the Eagles are denying, I should say. The Giants, however, probably not going to be any too thrilled. With what is going on. In the meantime, I want to make something very, very clear here real quick before we get going with the show today. And that is I have read and seen what is going on with Dak Prescott. What we have with Dak Prescott is an allegation. We have his attorney calling it an extortion. And we have the alleged victim's attorney saying that it's smoke and mirrors and that it's taking away from the real issue. That's the meat of what we know. The allegation is from 2017. We're not going to talk about it. I'm not going to make a a pre jump. You know, I'm not going to jump to any conclusions before the fact because we don't have all of the facts. So for anybody who's getting on their broadcast radio station today, for anybody who's on ESPN, for anybody who's doing whatever they're doing, that's cool. They can go ahead and say whatever the hell they want to say. On this show, we deal in facts, not opinions of the emotion. We don't jump to conclusions over here. We don't jump the gun on anybody and say, well, so-and-so is a piece of garbage or I can't believe they're lying about this. Why would they wait seven years? Not going to happen here. We're going to wait and we're going to find out why. Because A, that's the right thing to do for both parties. And B, that's just how I roll. It's called real journalism. And that's all there is to that. In the meantime, it is Friday. That means our MMA insider, Austin Ford, is kicking it with us. Austin, thank you for joining the show once again today, my man. Thank God it's Friday. Let's go. (laughs) I know that's right. Uh, Real quick here, I'm pretty sure everybody's seen it by now. Uh, Francis Sungana was not only knocked out, he was knocked down three different times. Uh, did Anthony Joshua silence anything about boxing for Francis Sungana in a rematch with Tyson Fury, which, by the way, you didn't believe he was going to get by Joshua to begin with. So there's that. Well, I we used MMA math just to throw that out there. You know, boxing math, you know, he almost beat Fury. Fury beats Joshua, and now it's all shook up. But I think what we what we see now is what the truth is, and that is Tyson Fury underestimated Ngannou, came in out of shape, and underestimated that power. Plus, he got dropped, so he probably didn't, you know, perform uh, without fear of the next big shot landing against Ngannou. And then we see Joshua just really make him look uh, inexperienced in boxing. And that, that's the nicest way I could put it. He, every feint got huge bites out of it, huge reactions. And a guy like Joshua, who's as big as Ngannou, uh, clearly a, a sharper puncher, he saw the openings, he capitalized. And then poor Ngannou, he got sent back out there to get slaughtered. They could have stopped the fight, the knockdown before the knockout. And right away, Joshua steps to the range, faint, and hit him exactly where he wanted to, how hard he wanted to, when he wanted to. It was a, it was a dream come true, except in the dream, the punches don't land as hard. But in reality... This one put Ngannou 
to just lights out. And, and I worry about his knee, too. It was, it was unfortunate to watch, but absolutely the stars are back in their position and uh, all is right in the boxing versus MMA world. Yeah, I guess you could say we can get back to normal. And, and look, <laughs> here's the thing, right? It, yeah, it, and it, it, it's not... MMA versus boxing, it's MMA versus MMA. Jorge Masvidal, Nate Diaz. Now they're going to have a boxing match on June the 1st. First of all, I really don't understand why everybody wants to do boxing all of a sudden. I, maybe there's, I know there's more money involved usually with boxing, but it, it, look, is this going to be a big enough draw? I mean, because obviously later on that month, you're going to have Tyson and, and Paul. Uh, you've got the NBA Finals generally going on around that time. And I just... I don't know. For my money, look, the UFL might be bigger than this fight. <laughs> you know, uh, the boxing is is easier for the MMA guys, especially two MMA guys. It, it might as well be a, a sparring match. So, and it's safe. And it's simple. And like you said, there's more money. But these MMA guys, they're underestimating those gloves. And when you get in there with a real boxer that actually knows how devastating these gloves can be, when you underestimate it as an MMA fighter, you're going to get clipped and, and things are going to change real quick. I'm not even sure what type of gloves they'll be using in this fight. But if it's actual puncher's gloves, it's going to be more exciting. If it's some soft you know, safe gloves, it's going to be boring. And, you know, what What are we going to see? Uh, a replay of their first meeting in the UFC, which was, you know, pretty much a boxing match. You know, Masvidal won fairly easily. We saw Diaz in his last match. He got tired. He tried to use his, you know, kind of, Lucy goosey style, you know, that's, that's really not going to work too well uh, in boxing. And so, you know, what do we want to do? We want to pay the early bird special and pay forty nine ninety nine to get the pay-per-view or, or, or oh, we're going to wait it out. Uh, we'll, we'll decide later and pay seventy nine ninety nine. It's, it's a reach. I get it. You know, throw the high ticket price out there. Because uh, that shows you believe in in the promotion, I guess. But I just don't see this as uh, exciting. It doesn't excite me. I'm gonna watch it. I'm not gonna tell you how I'm gonna watch it, but I'm gonna watch it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm gonna save my money. Well, and you know, Nate Diaz has already been embarrassed by a YouTube boxer. I, I really, and, and the thing is, I've always said, and, and look, I get it. Part of it is Nate Diaz trying to make fun of Conor McGregor. But after a while, he just looks really silly to me. Because Brody has, every time McGregor says he's going to retire, Nate Diaz says he's going to retire. McGregor says he's going to box. Immediately, Nate Diaz went to, well, I'm going to go box. Well, Conor McGregor was able to somewhat hang in with, at the time, probably the world's best fighter. Nate Diaz got embarrassed by a YouTuber. And we're, we're talking about two completely different athletes here, if you ask me. Why does Nate continue to pursue things that McGregor does? What, I, does, I, does he feel like McGregor's somehow disrespectful to the to the fight game or something? I, I've never understood it, man. Well, Nate Diaz... I think, and I can quote him on saying this, you took, you're taking everything I worked for, and that's it, you know? And, yeah. and I, so, so, I mean, I would, I would like to think this is just a money grab. It's just business. It's just the next thing you do towards the end of your fight career. You know, you, you go into promotion, you start doing boxing. Uh, if, if it's pay-per-view, you sell the fight, you know? Nate Diaz is who he is, but, you know, I just don't see it as, as a, as a combat sports choice. Now, is he, is he copycatting Conor McGregor? Is he really affected by Conor McGregor? I, I guess he is because like you illustrated the, the, the correlation, but he, 
he's just he's not as good as Connor, but he clearly stated you're taking everything that I worked for, and I, I feel I feel sorry for him. Uh, I feel bad for him. I'd rather see those guys fight in MMA again on UFC 300 or something. And I'll tell you this: McGregor was in an excellent mindset when he fought Floyd Mayweather, and he trained hard. And McGregor's mindset and, and his, his his ability to be disciplined, he truly trained hard for that fight. And so did Jake Paul versus Nate Diaz. But Nate Diaz, he he probably just did what he, he would do because he likes to go to the gym. He likes to hit the bag. He likes to hit mitts. He likes to spar. Uh, it's a much slower pace. He's, he's not firing his shots off. Uh, being explosive like Jake Paul is, you know, conditioning his body for that. And so we just see a different shape. I think a Nate Diaz that had a real true boxing camp and he has a great boxing coach, but I'll bet you that boxing coach says, well, I, I can't get him to train like a, a regular boxer. I can't get, he, he smokes weed every day. And uh, contrary to what uh, people believe, marijuana definitely will make you worse. It definitely does. It's in charge of shape, focus. You know, it's not friendly jujitsu. We're rolling around, you know, high as a giraffe's rear ends. But, you know, in boxing, <laughs> in boxing, it's, it's, it's twitch. It's timing. It's speed. It's faint. It's explosive. You, you can't just be loosey goosey and, oh, I'm high in here. And, you know, so, I wouldn't say there's too much of a separation. I really respect Nate Diaz. I respect Conor McGregor, but look at Conor McGregor when he stopped training like he used to. I think things things got bad for him. Even Poirier, you know, he 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 smashed Poirier young at 145 pounds, but he was kind of slow and kind of sluggish when he lost. And I think that's what we'll see in McGregor's next fight. He's going to be bigger, heavier, slower. Mayweather, I absolutely would just annihilate Conor McGregor now, for sure. Worse, worse than happened last time. I don't think he makes it out of the first three rounds uh, with McGregor now. But let's go. Nate Diaz, Masvidal, I guess. And we'll talk about it next Friday, maybe Monday. <laughs> well, and and don't forget that Nate Diaz recently was seen asking for the for the fight to make with with Conor McGregor. He went to the third fight, and Dana White flat out said, "I'm not making that fight." Like he he laughed at the idea of making that fight. So I mean, he's obviously moved on from it. And again, that just it, it proves to me that whatever McGregor does, Nate Diaz is just right there following him around. Uh, real quick here, Blades after his prelim fight, called out Aspinall, said that's the fight that he wants to make. Now, to be fair, we've seen this before. We know how it ended. But here's the thing. Aspinall, we still have an interim champion here. We've got to unify this belt first and foremost to me. Uh, But regardless, Blades, Aspinall, would you be excited for that fight? It's a a rematch. Uh, I know uh, I have acquaintances that... uh, or in the Blades camp in my coaching travels. And I know that they, Curtis could improve. And there's a chip on his shoulder. You know, he's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's any, any given Saturday. Right. And I, I like the fight. I like that. He's, you know, shooting for the stars. He's trying to run that back. I like all that. That's, that's the, the great thing about MMA. You know, most of these boxing guys, they eke one out and they don't give the guy another shot. You know, you got these, or unless in the contract, the championship uh, result, mandatory uh, rematch, you know. But, yeah, I like it. Curtis Blades is dangerous, you know. Heavy hands, great wrestling. Aspinall's obviously uh, has the, the victory over him and is on a, uh, a steeper climb. You know, he's, he's higher in the rankings. He's, he's the interim champion. Uh, yeah, I mean, do I sound that excited about it? But, yeah, I'm going to tune in. <laughs> <for sure. laughs> 
if it gets made, of course, which, you know, as, as we've talked about several times on the program, Dana has been putting pressure on, you know, whoever wins the the fight with John Jones to take him on. But that that fight has to happen first and foremost. So, you know, who the hell really knows? I mean, anymore, these guys are fighting six months, eight months out anyway. So we, we could see a fight in between regardless. Uh, Sugar Shane. Finishes off 299 with his first title defense. Comes away with a victory. How did Sugar Shane look to you? He looked. Or Sean, pardon me. Sugar Shane, Sugar Sean, Sugar Ray. Sugar, sugar yeah, yeah, damn man. And, and I'm old, bro, so I, my my brain just reverts back. You know what I mean? Like I'm. We we'll just call yeah. him Sugar. Sugar. Yeah, Not sugar. Yeah, there you go. With the hearty, uh, but, uh, <laughs> so I thought he looked great. I thought he looked improved, right? Like he keeps getting better. He, he, he looked fast and sharp. And, you know, if you watch him in his first fights, he, he was built like a boy, you know, and, and now whether it's the tattoos and the hair, but he, he looks more rugged, you know, he, that's, he's trending in the right direction because he'll have to be. And, um, you know, I recently had, uh, a fighter uh, last weekend, same same issue. Uh, the opponent just would not go down, and he throwing like, hitting him everything with the kitchen sink, face bloodied up, up two rounds, and then my guy gasped because he kept trying to knock him out. I mean, every every shot he threw, he's trying to knock this guy out. I told him after the second round or the first round, I said, "You're not going to knock this guy out, not to the head." maybe to the body, but you're not going to knock this guy out. So we need to make an adjustment here. We need to fight instead of just going to try to punch this guy. And he lost. He lost by submission uh, late in the third round uh, out of complete fatigue. He didn't even recover from the fight for 45 minutes. Even if he would have won the fight, he would have been laying in the back, puking in the bucket, exhausted because he's holding his breath, throwing everything with every shot. And then we see Sean O'Malley. They know Cheeto Vera has never been dropped in the UFC. They know this already, right? But Sean O'Malley, his ego, just like my buddy's ego, I'm going to try to knock him out. I'm going to try to knock him out. Just like just like my fighter, you'll, you'll see. You'll hear about him again. But he, he knew, he, Sean O'Malley knew he couldn't knock him out before. He tried, realized he couldn't after he hit him with that knee that he says he felt something break in his face. And then he, he settled in, and he didn't get bored just bouncing his gloves off of Cheeto's face. You know, most, most, <laughs> uh, most, of, most of these fighters, they, they end up, you know, if they say you hit somebody with everything you got, does that encourage you to try to keep doing that? Sometimes. Sometimes it discourages guys. Like, I've hit this guy with everything, and he's not falling uh-oh, I'm in trouble. And then I, my advice to, to both of those scenarios is, <laughs> do you like fighting or not? You know, do you, are you getting bored because you're having to be skillful and, you know, the guy's face is not exploding when you hit it? You know, that we're here to fight, not to uh, just go as hard as we can. There has to be a professional pace. It's shown O'Malley, put that on display and he's, he's coached by a great coach. They knew that going in great cornering in the corner. He just, you know, he kept hitting him with shots that would have knocked a lot of people out, a lot of people out, but Cheeto Vera, he just doesn't have an off button. And that's, that's, there's, that's not more common than you think. But Mike Tyson, he would say those guys, he felt worse for at the, at the end of the fight because they took way more shots than the guys he's putting away with, with the big one, right? Those guys last just because physiologically their brain doesn't reboot and then they, they take a lot more damage and that's what Cheeto, Cheeto's working with. He, he got his, like, punches don't hurt. Getting punched in the face, it doesn't hurt unless something breaks, like a nose, uh, an eye socket, the skin breaking was no no problem, 
or which we saw MVP cave in Cyborg's forehead. You saw his reaction like, oh my gosh, something is wrong. Referee saved me. But Cheeto, you know, he just he just doesn't shut off. His face got broken, nothing. You saw his face was nice and swollen, like in a way that, you know, I don't think it was a Joanna, you know, J-Chick type of swelling. It, it was because there was major structural trauma to his face. He never complained. He never stopped fighting. He even hurt Sean O'Malley with the final punch of the fight. What would have happened if there were 30 more seconds? I mean, O'Malley would have done that, but that ligger shot landed clean. He had to sit down. He probably would have fought through it, but he was, Cheeto was in that fight to the very end. Uh, now, that's, that's an exciting fighter. I hope he's okay. He took a lot of shots. Uh, he's been talking to back online, so I'm guessing he's fine. But uh, that's, that's not a sustainable style to uh, catch punches with your face. You know, I'm going to make a miss or, or block some of those, you know. Well, if he wants to fight like Rocky, he can go right on ahead. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, and, and look, here's my thing. To be fair, and I said this, and you know this a few times already. To me, Sugar Sean really doesn't have that fighting punches, that, that puncher's real true knockout power to he, me. He does. He I, does. I promise. I, I I see a lot of dancing around still. I mean, he was a lot more focused. I didn't see a lot of that stuff, obviously, when he fought Cheeto. Mm-hmm. But, it, I mean, come and look, and like you said, Cheeto hasn't been put down. But I, I, I think, for me, as good of a performance as that was, I just really, truly want to see him get in there, no BS, no messing around, and just put somebody down. And to me, that will not only, you know, prove it, but I think that's going to make all the other fighters look around and go, you know, <laughs> this guy's just not purple and, and rainbow colored hair and, and a lot of fun and real quick and agile and he's too damn good for his own good. When he's lasered in, there's potentially nobody better in the world, you know? So, uh, and, and him having a championship belt certainly uh, proves that right now, but, you know, again, how long can it be sustained with the the dancing around and the woo woo, you know, which is fine. Fans love it, but you know, eventually, like MVPs of the world, they all get caught, man. So that's, but that's my personal thing. Uh, real, real, real quick here, Austin. What's the next fight to make for Sean O'Malley? Do you think? I think it's Marab Devashvili. I think it's mm. definitely. I mean, that like you said, there's. There's still questions about Skinny Sean, I mean, Sugar Sean, you know, and his power. Uh, so what's going to happen when he fights uh, a stud wrestler? Yeah, but then again, Al Jermaine certainly was a stud wrestler, and he got put away. I think he underestimated Sean, though. And, but then again, now, DeVos, really, he'll be able to take uh, Sugar Sean down and once it's down on the ground, it's it's over. Or the pace of Murad, you know, O'Malley, how's he going to deal with that? You know, it's the Rocks Billy. That's, that's the fight to make. Uh, make him defend it against the wrestler. I think if he beats the Rocks Billy, there's, there's no more talk, you know, of whether he's a real champion. But I'll tell you what, Murad better be careful because they all underestimate his power. And what I know from old school boxing uh, coaches that I've uh, had the pleasure of speaking with over the years, it's the, it's the leverage of the lean guy that is the most powerful uh, punching for, for knockouts, right? It's, it's the longer levers lining up perfectly with snap on the end of the punches. And that's what sends all that power into one moment. And we've seen Sean O'Malley flatline people with one shot. He, he's done it over and over. Now, those guys were world championship uh, caliber fighters. That's true. It was early in his career, but he was lighter, younger. Now he's 
thicker, stronger, uh, better. And I, I think he could put Marab away because he's got to he's got to come through that. He's got to make it past that. Sean O'Malley can fight backing up. He's knocked out. He was he was backing up somewhat when he knocked Aljamain Sterling down. So they better take it serious. You know, don't under don't look at across the the cage and see a a skinny braided up color. You know, now he's got all these tattoos, pink shorts. You know, that guy there that he will snipe you down. He can break your face. He can bloody you up. He can put you away because he's going to hit you on your mouth and in your chin. He's going to hit you in the right spot. He's going to turn your head and you're. Unless you've got that Cheeto Vera beard, you are going to uh, get knocked down or knocked out. And, and mark my words, I promise, I, I, I think of Mike Tyson as the most devastating puncher. But then you think of the Hackler and Hearns, you know, it's, 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 I've learned this over the years. It's the leverage, it's the pop, it's magic touch of sleep where and it doesn't even look like that guy's throwing hard. Why are these guys falling? There's a, there's a lot of factors and, uh, you know, it's, it's exciting to, to watch it unfold, to kind of know the secret, to see a muscled up guy, low to the earth, big hooks, big shots against a skinny guy. That's, you know, seemingly dancing around, which I promise you that is all, like like Alan Iverson, how he's doing a classic crossover, but how is he getting people to bite so hard on that? You know what he's doing. He's going to cross you over. Even Michael Jordan, how is he getting them to bite on that? It's the same thing with O'Malley. That same magic thing. He can make you miss. He can he can make you take a, a, a different step. He can make you go, man, I can't find this guy. About you know, we get frustrated like. You, you feel like I should be able to hit this guy, and you just can't. It's it's uh, it's very unique. And you hear Adesanya, he, he'll give a uh, a perception of Sean O'Malley. He loves watching Sean O'Malley fight. He loves it. He sees he sees him as aiming and firing. You know, uh, he sees him tactically breaking down his opponents. And if Adesanya sees that, we we that's a that's a, a Example of game recognizing game, and I recognize the game about Asanya. So it's like just, you know, I, I, it's exciting to me. I, I, I thought Aljamain was going to take him down and win. I thought she, he would he would uh, embarrass Chito Vera easily like he did, and I think Devos really is going to take Sean O'Malley down and win the belt. But I'm not counting out Sean O'Malley's power. Now, that's really the, the, the thing. He's going to use his feet. He's going to use his uh, elusiveness. But he's going to hit you hard right there where your brain goes, what are we doing in here? And it might just put you all the way to sleep. So it's going to be exciting. But the boss really is the fight to make, not that Ilya Tapuria fight. Too early for that. <laughs> There you have it, everybody. He is Austin Ford, our MMA insider, and I am simply Drew Duncan. The show is fired up, and we are live. Austin, thank you so much again for giving me a little bit of your time today, my man. My pleasure. I will see you next time. Yes, sir. In the meantime, Saquon Barkley and the Philadelphia Eagles – the Atlanta Falcons with Kirk Cousins, they have been accused of tampering. The The reality is, is you're not supposed to be able to talk directly with the athlete during the, quote, legal tampering period. You can only speak with their agent. So everything that happens at this juncture is basically via third party. You have somebody that is from an organization. They go directly to the agent and they say, hey, would your guy potentially be interested in coming here? Here's the deal that we would potentially offer. And then they, the agent then goes back and says, hey, so-and-so, here's what's going on.
Now, the Eagles have already said that they didn't have impermissible contact with Barkley before signing him. Barkley denied the tampering period. Barkley basically talked about Coach Franklin and being back in Pennsylvania and all that kind of stuff. That the conversation that supposedly went on between him and and Coach Franklin at Penn State was misinterpreted because he was saying that he's talking to the Philadelphia Eagles, but not talking to the Philadelphia Eagles. That's what it is. In fact, Coach Franklin may have been try snitching here, but the whole thing was, as he said during a press conference, that Barkley had spoke directly to the Eagles GM. So there's that. In fact, Barkley went on to say, the truth is the pitch, the sell was Penn State and how many Penn State fans or Eagles fans, but that was through my agent. My agent told me that. And again, the tampering policy is to protect member clubs, contract negotiating rights, and at the same time to allow the intraleague competitive systems devised for the acquisition and retention of player talent, end quote. Yeah, the two-day negotiating period. And let's also remember, and we saw this with Kendrick and the 49ers and the Dallas Cowboys. Kendrick had initially told the 49ers that he was going to sign with them and then ended up switching in and, and signing with the Dallas Cowboys instead. And so what we can see there is is that a player can go, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll probably sign with them. But that doesn't mean that they have to, and it doesn't mean that they will. It's essentially a soft verbal commit is essentially what it boils down to. And that was one of the things that I talked about a couple of days ago in the program before all the official signings happened. Look, none of this stuff is official. Any of it and all of it can change at any given moment. So let's just all keep that in mind. Now, whether or not this happened, who the hell really knows? I mean, let's be honest. If you're going to get busted for illegal tampering during the, quote, legal tampering period, that's... (laughs) That's the definition of irony, if you ask me, but I'll tell you what, here's what I do know is that the NFL has been just as shady as college football when it comes to this. I mean, come on, man. You look at Pete Carroll, how many times was he having impermissible contact with his players? How many times was he getting guys around for practices that he wasn't supposed to be having? Cam said he wasn't supposed to be having, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this has happened several times in the NFL. The NFL is not above reproach, and the NFL's got its own set of guidelines and rules for a reason. I mean, there is supposed to be an offseason where these guys get to walk away, essentially, and not worry about the game of football. But, you know, it's it's a 24-hour gig anymore. I mean, I remember growing up very vividly, and people would talk about guys like Shannon Sharp or whomever and go, man, their, their offseason routine is amazing. They're showing up to camp. They're clearly in shape. They've been obviously working hard around the clock. You know, you could take a month or two off if you wanted to and basically not do anything, sit around, get fat and bored. But they're not really doing that anymore, are they? It's year-round with these camps. It's year-round with training. It is a 24-hour gig now to be a football player in the NFL. It's the way that it is. Right? Remember when old boy came into Washington and supposedly Mike Shanahan said, look, you're out of shape, you're overweight, you're in a dangerous place, you're not going to be on this football team until you're back to where we need you to be. You know, Mike Shanahan got a lot of hell for that, and he got a lot of hell for that because of other things. But regardless, the point of what I'm saying is the offseason thing is very real. Now, it, to me, it's dumb to have legal tampering for a couple of days when technically all tampering is illegal and tampering is essentially talking to somebody that you're not supposed to be talking to because they're under official contract with another football team. So you're not allowed to approach them whatsoever. But the NFL said, fine, we're going to give you a little bit of leeway on this. And what we're going to allow you to do is go ahead and talk to the agent. And if you talk to the agent, that's fine. But it used to be you couldn't even talk to their agent. Everybody was just sitting around waiting for the new NFL season to begin. Once the new NFL season began, then that's when everything went down. 
basically what they've done now is they've said, look, we're going to give everybody an opportunity to create a deal that's unofficial. And once that, you know, you can talk to whoever attorney, whatever you want to do, yada, yada, yada. But then you got to wait for the official season to start before we're going to allow anybody to sign anything. That's essentially what they've done. So I wouldn't even, to me, the language is ridiculous to begin with. Legal tampering. It should just be something else. Anything. Hey, man, look, you've got, you know, this is the the two-day free agent period or the two a- two-day agency period where you get to talk to the agent and that's it. If they're representing themselves, if they're not listed as an official agent, then too bad, so sad, you don't get to talk to them. If they have an agent, great. And I don't think it would ruin anything for anybody because I think teams would be willing to wait a couple of extra days so that way they could talk to a Saquon Barkley, so that way they could talk to a Kayla Williams or whatever the case is, they would have that. And I I think it's just the language and the verbiage and all that that's ridiculous. And the fact of the matter is you've opened this line of communication, right, through the idiocy that is this, quote, legal tampering period you have opened up the line of communication, and so you leave yourself vulnerable to situations like this. Now, obviously, what's going to happen? Well, you know, look, it's going to be one of those things where it's going to be fine. You're going to get fined, I should say. You're probably going to lose a draft pick or two. You know, you, I mean, you could hurt yourself when all is said and done. Whether you want to call it the legal tampering period or whatever you want, and, and did it happen? I mean, who the hell really knows? Did Saquon accidentally say too much? Maybe. Did did coach from Penn State potentially try snitch? It's a possibility. But I, I think that the pitch is correct because Saquon, look, you're, you're making a move from the Giants to the Eagles. And, and everything is all about keeping the fans on your side. I mean, look, this is night and day from C.J. Gardner, right? C.J. Gardner called the Philadelphia fans and obnoxious, not a little annoying, not a tad misunderstood, not exceptionally passionate, none of that, not a little obnoxious. He called him obnoxious. It's exactly what he did. So what's the deal now? Well, the deal now is this. We need somebody in here that's going to be with the fan sided area that we're going to need for this team we need to bring some interest back into this football team how do we do it we get a guy who was really successful at Penn State who we could basically list him as somewhat as a hometown guy and we could bring him in and and everybody would be really excited about hey Saquon is where he's supposed to be and hopefully (laughs) Eagles fans won't think too much about CJ Gardner but You never know. Like I said, me, if I lived in Philly, I would respect the hell out of it. At least he kept it real and didn't sugarcoat it. Kind of like that Bill Burr stand up. You got 10 minutes left. 10 minutes left. If you've never seen that, put in YouTube, Bill Burr roasts Philly fans. One of the most epic rants of all time. At the end, they respected him. So I got to tell you, I think Philly fan may actually end up respecting C.J. Gardner-Johnson, regardless, whatever's going to come out of this is whatever's going to come out of this. They've both signed. That's pretty much all there is to it. Whether or not either one of them did it, who the hell really knows. I will say this. Kirk Cousins has got a lot of money for one playoff win, which we may be getting into a little bit later on. But in the meantime, still plenty of other things to get to. The NCAA is basically on the brink of a 14-team playoff. Quote, the 10 FBS conferences and Notre Dame are pushing to meet a Friday deadline to agree to the next contract and inform the CFP if they will participate in the playoff in 2026 and beyond. Well, here's the scenario, okay? And I want to be clear about this first. And that is we're we're expanding and then we're expanding again all of two seasons later, right? I don't really understand what the point of all of that is. I mean, we're essentially getting to the point now where we are doing a an invitational for the college football playoff. 
the SEC Invitational, I should say. That's what that amounts to. Because I just feel like all of this is to try and get more SEC teams in there. Why do we need more of a certain conference? And and by the way, it's predominantly being spearheaded by the Big Ten, by the SEC. We're going to be getting more of them in there. And why are we going to be doing that? Well, because these conferences are condensing. And we're getting to a point now where we're talking about super conferences. Where we may have just like two super conferences and then everybody else is on the outside. That's what it's going to amount to, which kind of blows my mind when you think about it because college football is expanding in Division One all the time. I mean, it wasn't so long ago that we barely had 100 teams in Division One college football. Now we're up to well over 130. Not to mention that in the meantime, they still got to make a TV deal, which ESPN right now holds that TV deal with the college football playoff. A deal that was worth somewhere in the neighborhood totaling of $3.1 billion, if I remember correctly. And that is per the Sports Business Journal. I just, we, I, I think that there's no solution that we're offering by adding more teams to make this a more viable approach. I think we're just repadding, rebranding, redoing. It's kind of like the iPhone 10 and then the iPhone 11. And, you know, I'm sure everybody has seen the meme where the guy is wearing a shirt and then he holds up the shirt and it's like iPhone 10 to iPhone 11. And it's the exact same damn thing. That's essentially what we're looking at is the exact same damn thing over and over again. And I'm sure that everybody's heard the saying before the definition of insanity is is doing the same thing over again and expecting a different result. There's nothing new that is being added here. And if conferences don't want to participate in the, quote, college football playoff, then they don't have to. And the, quote, burden of the coaches is no longer on voting for the national champion. It was like that during the BCS era. The BCS was very confusing because a lot of people did not understand that the bowl championship series was just that. You were just the bowl championship series champion, and the coaches would just greatly consider whoever came out of that thing the winner for the, quote, national championship game, which was really just the big bowl championship series game. And everything else was just a part of that series, the Orange Bowl, the Fiesta Bowl, the Rose Bowl, etc. It was all just a part of that series. It was really no different in a lot of ways than the old way of doing things, which I got to tell you, I'm starting to wonder if it really was that bad. Sure, we didn't get to see Nebraska play Michigan years ago, and it happened the year before the BCS all happened. And then we kind of had the repeat of that, right? History repeating itself. We had an undefeated Florida State team get left out by the committee right before we expand to 12 teams. Everybody blamed Florida State for not being in because they voted against having the expansion done right away, which to me was a moot point because they were undefeated. Give a damn if you're down to your fifth string quarterback. You're an undefeated football team. And offensively, they were just kind of minding their time and letting the defense win games so that way they could be undefeated, be a conference champion, and then get to the championship. But the NCAA and the committee has made it abundantly clear that the regular season no longer matters. Conference, essentially, except for the Big Ten and the SEC, no longer matters. Ohio State, remember, they got the jump in over. Now, I justified it. And said, look, the committee was right. Whether we liked it or not, the committee was correct in what they chose to do. But I just couldn't justify Florida State being left out. Hell, I didn't like the fact that Central Florida was left out. They were undefeated. If you are undefeated to me, you get a shot. If you get blown out, whatever. Notre Dame's been blown out. OU's been blown out multiple times in the college football playoff. Notre Dame was blown out during the BCS era and in the college football playoff era. To me, it doesn't matter 
what team you are, where your conference is. If you're undefeated, you get a shot. And that was our understanding that this was going to incorporate some of these other teams. Let's not forget during the BCS era, Utah got left out. Boise State got left out. Hell, even Auburn got left out because of their strength of schedule with the computer system. They had to take a game against Maine, and that kept them from getting in even though they were undefeated. And the national champion was voted on by the coaches, and the 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 computer system would take in the, the championship series, the overall record, the strength of schedule, the voting from the AP and the coaches poll, and it would tally eight, and that was how your national champion was essentially decided. But even then, still, you have an AP national champion. You have the college football playoff champion, which is now considered your national champion. It's just crazy to me. There's Look, if you want to create a system that matters, then it's time to just shift to more of an FCS playoff system, more of an NFL-type playoff system. That's all there is to it. If that's how we're going to decide the national champion. And how are we going to do that? Are we going to take half the damn teams in, in college football? No, that's ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous that they're talking about expanding to 80 or even 90 teams in the NCAA tournament. We don't need that much. You, you take your conference champions, you let them all in, and you go from there. I think you do away with the conference championship game because, as I've said, it's just the next game. That's all that it really is. It's each side of the division – and to me, you even get rid of those. You don't have an Eastern division anymore or Western division or whatever the case is. You do away with subdivisions within these conferences. And you have a conference champion. You set a schedule. This is what you're playing. You do more conference games than you do out-of-conference games. You, you limit the season back down to 10, 11 games. You have three out of conference games, you have eight in conference games, you have your conference champion, and you go from there. It's pretty simple. You could have 16, 20 teams at the most, and that's how you do it. Somebody's going to get a bye week, somebody's going to earn that. There's no reason to keep this pageant alive. This is not ice skating, okay? This is not. Any of that. We are not here to judge somebody on how pretty their win is. It's annoying to me when I have to sit around and watch a college game of football and somebody go, well, even though there's a little bit of time left here, Florida State might want to score a touchdown just to try and impress the judges, the committee. See, essentially what you're saying is impress the judges. Why? Did they not watch the football game? If somebody scores late and it looks like it was a blowout and instead of 17 to 6, it's 24 to 6, then that tells me that they really didn't watch the game. How much you win by shouldn't be that impressive to a committee. Not necessarily. Teams are going to struggle against bad football teams with bad matchups. But see, we have to start splitting these hairs. And why do we have to do that? Because we decided that college football is the world's biggest beauty pageant. That it is figure skating. Why? What's the necessity in that? It's already proven to be a corrupt system. And if the regular season doesn't matter anymore, and you're just going to basically make it the Big Ten and SEC Invitational, then there's just no point. And I understand, again, that these conferences are expanding. You know, the, the competition as a result should be getting better. But ask yourself this. With USC and what we just saw for them and Lincoln Riley over the last couple of years, do you really believe that they are adding real competition to the Big Ten? Is Colorado, the way that they are now, adding real competition to anybody? Arizona, Arizona State, 
UCLA, what we've seen from them over the last few years, Utah. Utah was the Pac-12 champion, but they also got beat by a Florida football team who didn't even finish 500 a couple of seasons ago when they were conference champion. The point of what I'm saying is it's time to do away with it. We don't need a committee anymore. We don't need any of that. Ten conference champions, you're all in. And that's all there is to it. And then from there, it's a playoff system. Pretty simple. And if you're undefeated, I don't give a damn. It's guaranteed. By the way, I am excited to announce that I have officially partnered with the HHN TV network. That is Hip Hop Nation TV down in Atlanta, Georgia. Beginning in August, they will be hosting the show on the platform as well. You'll finally get to see, if you don't know by now, what this bro actually looks like. And I'm just going to let everybody know that if you've heard the word, I am, in fact, a five foot eight bro. Five eight, white. You know, people are like, well, you're Italian. No, I'm white. It's okay. <laughs> it's, it's really okay. No worries. So I am excited for that. It's going to be going on starting in August where I will post episodes up there. They will be pay-per-view the first day, and then the day after, they'll be free. Got to make a little bit of ducky somehow, some way. But I did make it cheap for everybody, 99 cents, because, well, I'm a man of the people, and I understand that people want to watch sports and talk sports and all that stuff. So right out of the gate for the first 24-hour period, it'll be 99 cents. But I guess you finally get to see the look on my face, right? Especially when Austin Ford said stuff like he did today. Sean O'Malley never got tired of bouncing his fist <laughs> off of Cheeto's face. Man alive. Well, Keenan Allen is reportedly headed to the Chicago Bears. Look, everybody keeps talking about what does this mean for Justin Fields? What are they going to do with him in Chicago? First of all, if you're Justin Herbert, you're going, bro, I don't have Mike Williams anymore. I don't have Keenan Allen anymore. Uh, what do you want me to do here, compadre? <laughs> you guys haven't went out and got me an offensive lineman. You haven't, you haven't done really much of anything here. You're, you're losing my pieces to the puzzle. Which, to be fair, the Mike Williams trade. Or releasing him, I should say. I mean, look, that's $20 million in cap space, right? Over the last two seasons, he'd only played literally half the games. In fact, in seven years, he's only played one full season. There's no more Austin Eckler. He went to Washington. I guess running back by committee, right, was Spiller, Kelly, and Dotson. No more Keenan Allen. They need linemen. Bo says he got a restructure. We know that. Khalil Mack restructured, so there's that. But is is Bosa going to restructure? It's going to happen with him. Look, I can't be mad at Jim Harbaugh for gutting the football team the way that he is, okay? He, he looked around, and he said, look, this is the team that I've got. This is what we have. This is what we're going to do with it. And I'm going to make some real serious decisions. And to be fair, I, I'm really not mad at him. Uh, look, I, I talked about Louisville, for instance, with basketball just yesterday, how they need a ballsy coach. Somebody who's going to come in and say, look, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to need. You're going to give me X amount of time, and that's all there is to it. Jim Harbaugh looked and saw a football team that was 5-12 and 12 and said, why? What, what reason do we have to be 5-12? and 12? And again, here's my thing. I don't think Justin Herbert's got very long either. I think he's got this season to show Jim Harbaugh something. But it's just crazy to me. The the, the Keenan Allen thing, that's a little different. Okay, now we're to a place where, look, if that doesn't prove that everybody's job is on the line and that includes Justin Herbert, I don't know what does. My initial reaction 
to Coach Harbaugh with the football team that the L.A. Chargers currently had at that time, with him going over there, was, okay, now they're contenders in, in the division. I'm not saying anybody's going to take down Kansas City Chiefs. Okay, so Kansas City Chief fan, you could chill the hell out. I know that you're all big fans because you got Patrick Mahomes. Okay, and you can tell me you were a Chiefs fan lifelong all you want to, but I'm sorry, I'm from Kansas, and when I walked into Buffalo Wild Wings, I saw a lot of jerseys back in 2014, 2015, even in 2016. I'll tell you what jersey I saw the least of, and that was Kansas City Chief. So you can say whatever the hell you want to, but you're really loud right now, and that's fine. Be happy and enjoy it while you can. Because if anything happens to number 15, you are done. Just so you know. I'm not hoping for anything to happen to number 15. I'm just saying. You have no backup plan. You shouldn't, but you don't. I'm just saying. Now, the situation at hand is this. My initial thought was they could contend. When Antonio Pierce went to the Raiders, I thought they could contend. But the Raiders have been too busy adding pieces and not giving pieces away. Look, okay, fine. They let go of Jimmy G. Who the hell didn't see that coming? What has Jimmy G ever done? He went to a Super Bowl. He was a big part of the reason why they blew that lead. Guys open all over the place, couldn't connect. Everybody blamed Shanahan for the play calling. But at the end of the day, those calls were there. That game should have been put away. Not to mention he's going to be suspended by the NFL for alleged PED use. So that was not a bad move. They went and they added Wilkins to defense, right? So now you got Crosby and Wilkins on the defensive line alone. As of the moment, you still had Devontae Adams. Sure, you lost Jacobs, but then you 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 counter by adding another back, so you're fine. You're probably going to draft a running back. And maybe Jacobs just doesn't fit in with the scheme that you're going to have, and that's okay. He's a hell of an athlete, but does he fit in with the scheme? That's just it. So when you look at the Chargers and what Jim Harbaugh wants to do, Is everybody going to fit in with his scheme? Jim Harbaugh is very old school, man. Under center, big sets, tough nose defense, grind out the football. You know, is Blake Corm going to be there? Remember, they they don't have Austin Eckler anymore. Like I said, he went to Washington. So with Eckler gone, it really makes the, the draft pretty crazy, though. There's really not a receiver out there that you can get. Calvin Ridley, he's signed elsewhere. Mike Evans decided to stay in Tampa Bay. McCole Hardman. So what are you going to do? This <laughs> is Tell you what, the draft for the Chargers is going to be really interesting to say the least. Now, as far as Chicago and, and Justin Fields and all this, Look, has anybody stopped to think to themselves that maybe they're adding pieces around this guy? Has anybody even considered that that is what is going on in Chicago? Has anybody thought to themselves, hey, maybe the Bears don't want to get rid of him. Maybe this is all just bad press, which would not be something that is uncommon. Maybe that's what it is. Has anybody thought to consider that? And no, there's no world where Kayla Williams and Justin Fields get to be on the same football team. I want to make that very clear. If you draft Kayla Williams, you have to trade Justin Fields. It doesn't work, people. It's not about egos. It's about, look, man, you brought me in to do these things. You haven't given me much of anything to work with. Now you're getting some pieces around and you're telling me that I got to compete for my job. He's going to demand a trade. 
Why would he stick around for that? Look, I'm not the biggest believer in Justin Fields, okay? I haven't been since he was in college. There's no doubt that the kid's got wheels. But what's his development like? Look, there were some really good games that he played last year where he really shined through. And he showed that he could make some really tough-ass throws, man. Okay? But here's the thing. I've always said, and I maintain this, that it takes four years to truly learn how to be a quarterback in the NFL. We just saw C.J. Stroud have an incredible rookie season. Well, Vince Young was also rookie of the year. And where the hell is he? Okay? There are a lot of quarterbacks that come in and they have one really good season and we don't hear from them anymore. And you look at the Matt Liners of the world. You look at some of these other guys that had so many high expectations and they couldn't get it done, whether it was situational, whatever the case may be. Now, I maintain that there are organizations that you definitely don't want to play for. They have no direction. They have no nothing. They're, they're screwing around and they're just out of control. I get it. I get that not every situation is ideal for a quarterback to really develop in the league. And I've stood up for these players a million and one times over by not just going to the team that picks them. And I will maintain that. Simultaneously, once you're there, you have a responsibility to yourself at the bare minimum. I think Justin Fields has carried himself very well through this entire process. I think Justin Fields has handled the media very well. I think he's been very good at, at you know being a good teammate in the locker room and all that. You don't hear guys saying anything bad about him. The, the thing is this. I, I think a lot of this is media contrived. This is ESPN. This is Fox Sports all needing something to yell and hoot and holler about. When the fact of the matter is we don't know what's going to go on. The Bears have been quiet about everything because probably they haven't made a decision yet. And maybe they are just letting everybody flippantly run their mouths and say whatever the hell they want to and go, okay, that's fine. Whatever you think is out there is whatever you think is out there. We don't give a damn. We're not going to pay attention to that. Which at this point, it's probably the best move for Chicago because they're not good. And they've got a lot of improvement that they need to make. And to me, they've gone out and done the necessary things in free agency. But again, will it work out in terms of stylistically? Will it work out in the locker room? Will they be able to get along with the guys that are there hanging out and stuff like that? What's it going to be like? There's a million and one things other than just being a great athlete in the NFL that make you successful. And I think a lot of that gets lost. Let's not forget that when Peyton Manning initially went to the Denver Broncos, a lot of the conversation was, how's he getting acclimated with the guys? Because it wasn't his locker room, not the way it was in Indy. If you were a rookie in Indianapolis and you walked into the room and you saw Peyton Manning, you knew it was his joint. Peyton Manning had to reassert himself with the Broncos players. That's a lot of what gets missed with all this free agency, with all this talk, with all this stuff. If the fellas don't like you, it's a big thing. Russell Wilson, let's not forget that there were plays, especially one where, what was it, Ripon or whoever got mad because they weren't helping Russell Wilson, the lineman, they weren't helping him up off the, the pavement there. It speaks volumes. And I've said for the longest time that I don't think the Broncos, as a line, it's potentially that they haven't had a quarterback that they've wanted to play for. I don't think they wanted to play for Trevor Simeon. I don't think they wanted to play for Paxton Lynch. They're horrible, don't get me wrong. But regardless, the point is this. We don't really know what's going to happen with Justin Fields because nobody has made anything official. And until it's official, it's all just speculation. And you can speculate all the hell you want to, but you don't know until you know, and none of us really know. As of right now, Justin Fields is still a quarterback with the Chicago Bears. 
when we know, we'll know. And again, I want to re-announce my partnership with Hip Hop Network TV down in Atlanta, Georgia. I, I'm really excited for this, man. You know, it, it's cool because literally I'm going to be the only sports person that's on their platform. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to Cha Cha, Antoine, my homeboy P, who, you know, helped put that thing together. You know, P's been a big believer in mine, man. You know, I, I look. I've been in radio for a total combined time now for about 10 or 11 years. And I've had some very select people that have been in my corner. You know, James has been in my corner. My homeboy P has been in my corner. You know, I've got people that hit me up, you know, from time to time and tell me, you know, man, I listen to your show every day on, you know, whatever the case may be. Scott Jones, he's he's been big into my corner. Uh, we're discussing whether or not um, I'm good for his platform on on the app that he's getting ready to drop with Husky Fat. You know, there, there's been a lot of really good people in my corner. People that are allowing me to be myself. You know, look, I, I've worked for corporations. I've worked for companies in, in this business. And I, I've been in trouble for insulting KFC, which, by the way, the insult was... I don't have a problem with KFC. I, I love their their coleslaw. I think it's the best in the world, but I'm just really craving some Popeyes, and there's no Popeyes around here. And KFC is getting all butt hurt, calling up my boss. What the hell, man? We're sponsored. Well, get better chicken. How about that? I don't have to worry about that. I can get on this microphone, and I can tell Kentucky Fried Chicken, it's slop. It's greasy BS. And every time I eat it, I am in the bathroom for an hour and a half. It's worse than Taco Bell. Just letting you know, your overpriced chicken is garbage. I would rather eat Popeye's. Popeye's red beans and rice. Are you kidding me? Now, I am the type that I will literally go to Popeye's and I will order a big ass thing of chicken. I'll get some red beans and rice. And some mac and cheese. And then I will head right on over to KFC and get a big ass thing of coleslaw. Because I don't know what they're putting in that stuff. But it is crack cocaine to me. I love that damn coleslaw, man. Because I'm a, I'm a coleslaw connoisseur. I'm picky about my coleslaw. But I love that stuff. But you got to make it right. And only KFC makes it right. But everything else on that menu. I mean, every time I walk into that place, you could just smell the slop. And if anybody else likes it, that's cool, that's you, but that's not me. But see, I don't have to worry about getting in trouble for stuff like that anymore. I can get on this microphone and talk about what I want to talk about, what really happened. I don't have to sit around and defend ESPN anymore and go, well, you know, Chris Fowler's right. It doesn't help our bottom line at all to have the SEC. The hell it doesn't when you've got an investment the size that you do. Are you kidding me? You know how painful that is? To not be able to say what I really want to say, I can finally say what the hell I want to say. It's nice, man. It's nice. I don't have to worry about being called a homer anymore. You know, people on the internet, they don't know. If I stick up for Florida State, they don't know me. Oh, you Florida State fans. I'm not a Florida State fan. I'm saying what I think is the correct thing to do. That's what I'm talking about. When I stick up for Angel Reese, I I just feel like I'm doing the right thing. Nothing else has anything to do with it. When I talk about Draymond Green, I'm not a Golden State Warriors fan. In fact, if you know me, and you know me as a Broncos fan, and you know me as a Philly fan, and a Syracuse fan, you know that there's nobody actually that's harder on those teams than I am. Hell, I've had people on my show, I had a I had a pastor one time on my show, man. He's a huge Dallas Cowboy fan. He's like, man, you're a Broncos fan, and you're just out in your own team. Like, yeah? Nobody's going to be more critical of them than I am. It's not that I'm trying to prove a point or anything to that effect. I'm just telling you what I think is the truth, the reality. Because that's our job as journalists. I'm an accredited member of the media. We are truly supposed to be impartial, and everybody brags about being impartial, but I would love to see it. 
Everybody, I am Drew Duncan. The show's fired up, and we are live. I know that this weekend is a thing for a lot of people. I will say this. Whatever you choose to do, make sure and be safe. Lyft exists. Uber exists. Get a designated driver. Whatever the case may be, it is not worth it. It's not worth it to hurt yourself, somebody else. It's not worth it to get a DUI, any of those things. Everybody be safe. Take care of yourselves this weekend. Obviously, we'll be back on Monday with Selection Sunday happening in college basketball. We'll find out where Duke's going to be. They just got upset last night, obviously, so we'll see where they fall on Selection Sunday. In the meantime, your local programming is next, and as always, don't you dare touch that dial.